The title of our sermon this morning is The Light of the World. The Light of the World, and we've come to John chapter 8, and this text from verses 12 through 20, where again the Lord Jesus Christ is in the temple teaching. And, you know, just once again, returning to this glorious witness that is John's gospel. Amen? Uh, John's gospel is just a glorious text of scripture. I've heard it said that the gospel of John is shallow enough for the new believer to jump in and wade around in, but deep enough for the biblical scholar to drown in. Uh, These truths are simple, but the truths are very profound, deeply theological. And here we find another text uh, dealing with the Lord and his earthly ministry, and namely his confrontation with the Pharisees. John is making his case here, similar to an eyewitness in a trial, an expert eyewitness in a trial. He's making his case for the greatest truth claim ever to hit the ears of man. The greatest truth claim that has ever been made, that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the promised Messiah, the one in whom all the promises of God are yes and amen. In his own words, in John chapter 20, verse 31, John the evangelist, our author here, writes, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so like an expert eyewitness would in a trial, he takes his account from the life and testimony of Jesus Christ himself. We see an example of this in John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20, as once again in the temple, Jesus finds himself in conflict with the Pharisees. As we move ever closer to the cross, only a short six months away at this point, he finds himself more and more in conflict with them. Their hostility against him steadily increases, and they're prosecuting their wicked campaign against him on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis as he teaches in the temple. So you might imagine a hostile attorney and how a hostile attorney might cross-examine or badger a witness They're seeking any way possible that they can impugn his character. They can destroy his case, destroy his case as being the Messiah, God in the flesh, the promised Savior. And so as we come to John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20 this morning, we're going to look at this like a trial, so to speak. The Lord Jesus Christ is wickedly and unrighteously, ungodly, on trial before these Pharisees, before the Jewish opposition. And in verse 12, we see him give his opening statement. And there's never been a more glorious opening statement than the one we see from our Lord in verse 12. In verses 13 to 14, we're going to see the great witness. He calls forth the great witness in his case. Thirdly, in verses 15 to 18, we're going to see the righteous judge. The righteous judge. And lastly, we'll see the tragic verdict in verses 19 and 20. So this morning, we'll begin in verse 12 with the opening statement. The Lord's opening statement in verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So now once again, the Lord's in the temple. He's teaching the the people, and obviously the Pharisees, the scribes, the Jewish opposition are close by. From verse 20, if you drop down to verse 20, We know he's in a place in the temple complex called the treasury. Now the treasury was kept in a larger area called the court of the women. And once you made it up onto the temple mount, there was a gate that came through the eastern wall of the temple mount. Once you made it up onto the temple mount, most likely in Solomon's porch, we've heard about from scripture, as you're standing in Solomon's porch on the east side of the temple complex, you look forward toward the temple and you see there around the temple courts, what's called a soreg, a little knee-high short railing or lattice work. That soreg separated those on the outside from those on the inside, so to speak. So if you were a Gentile or an unclean Jew, you would have stayed on the outside of the soreg. But if you were Jewish and clean, purified, you could go past the soreg into the temple courts. From Solomon's porch, past the soreg, and through what was called the Gate Beautiful, you would have entered on the east side of the temple complex, the court of the women. Now you would call it that because that was as far as women were allowed to go. They were allowed to be in the court of women, but couldn't go any farther into the temple courts. Inside that, inside the court of the women, 15 steps up, elevated, 
was the court of the Israelites, the court of the men. Then you had the court of the priests. Beyond that, into the temple building itself, you had the holy place and the most holy place. Each time, dividing those who could enter. If you've seen pictures of that, pictures of the court of the women, if you looked out from the court of women east, you'd see a beautiful picture of the Mount of Olives. Just a really pretty scene, a really pretty place. The court of the women was an outer area of the temple complex where many people would have been coming and going. One of the reasons they would have been coming and going through there was because that was where the treasury was. That was where the alms boxes or the giving boxes were. They were called chauffeur boxes or trumpets because they looked like a trumpet. They were small on one end, large at the bottom. You would slip your coin, that shekel for the temple tax through the end, would fall into the chauffeur box. There were 13 of them, and the 13 chauffeur boxes were on either side of this court of the women held on either side. Each of them were labeled with where the money would go. So if you had a coin for the temple tax, there was a box meant for the temple tax. If you had one for alms for the poor or giving to provide food, there was a chauffeur box or a trumpet for that. All 13 labeled with where the money would go. This side area where these trumpets were located underneath a colonnade was called the treasury. And so just inside, if you look at that square area, the court of the women, just inside of that, you had four stationed in the corners. You had four towers where on the top of each of those towers, there were four bowls of oil. We call them towers, not really lampstands, because each of them had a ladder on it. And the priest would often climb the ladder to the top of the tower in order to light the bowls. When these bowls were lit, it said that the light from those bowls of oil would shower the entire city of Jerusalem in light. That every courtyard in the city would have a light that came from those flaming bowls of oil. Four towers. It's here among the hustle and bustle of the people and the priests as they came and went, giving to the treasury. And under those four brilliant shining lamp towers that the Lord Jesus Christ makes his opening statement. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You see the picture? This is one of the great I am statements of the Gospel of John. There are seven of them. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Later, we'll hear the Lord explain in John chapter 10, verse 9, that I am the door. I am the good shepherd, he says in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11, verse 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John chapter 14, verse 6. And I am the vine in John chapter 15, verse 5. Which, with each of these astounding, staggering, amazing claims, the Lord reaches back almost 1,500 years into Exodus 3 where God speaks to Moses from the burning bush on Mount Horeb. And Moses asks God there, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses asks. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am the being one, the self-existent one, the eternally existent one. I am has sent me to you. Here in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus reaches back into Exodus 3 and says, I am, ego me, the light of the world. It's an unusual construction, but it's the same thought. You have to understand, this is a claim to be God. This is a claim of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying here in John chapter 8, verse 12, just like he does in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, I, I am, ego me, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the Lord we serve. Amen? The Lord Jesus Christ. It's a clear statement that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, the Almighty. Romans chapter 9, verse 5 says, Christ is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. And you will die 
and go to hell when you die. Jesus will say soon in John chapter 8, verse 21, 24, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. The Jesus of Islam, the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jesus of the Mormons is not the Jesus of the Bible. If you believe as they teach, you will die in your sins. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and have life everlasting. He says, I am the light of the world. Now this statement, understanding what the Bible teaches, would have shocked the Pharisees. It would have just torn their gears. A staggering claim. They were face to face with a carpenter. This guy from out in the sticks in Galilee. And he is the incarnation of God. John chapter 1 verse 5 says, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, Jesus came into a world devastated by darkness, didn't he? It wasn't created dark, but it was made dark by sin. The fall of man darkened the heart of man with sin and subjected this world to futility. Because of their sin... All men are guilty. Because of their sin, all men come under the just condemnation of God and are cast out from the light of His presence. The souls of all men after the fall, outside of Christ, are like tar. They're like a pitch, inescapably and hopelessly black, and one day set on fire by hell. They're ungodly unholy, shameful, guilty, condemned, filthy. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, that although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were what? Were darkened, that's right. So we are nocturnal by nature. <laughs> we don't need night vision goggles we need light vision goggles. Amen? We need a transformation of heart. We need the Lord to do a miracle. Now, in order to comprehend the light, in order to comprehend Jesus Christ as the light of the world, it's necessary for you to come to grips with and to understand the darkness. And it's a darkness that is all around you, but not just all around you. It's a darkness that comes from within you. Let's take a look at the darkness from the prophet Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Let's take a look at the darkness from the prophet Isaiah. This is the world that the Lord Jesus Christ came into. A world where people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. A place where darkness and this world is under the sway of the wicked one. Look at Isaiah chapter 5 and drop down with me to verse 18. This section of text in Isaiah chapter 5 is a subsection, if you will, of woes, of pronouncements of judgment from the Lord given to the people of Israel, here given by Isaiah to the southern kingdom of Judah. We're in the time where the kingdom or the children of Israel are divided between northern and southern kingdoms. This prophecy given to the southern kingdom of Judah. Look at verse 18. Here the Bible reads, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. First point I want you to see from the first woe here beginning in verse 18 is that the darkness is deceitful. The darkness is deceitful. The picture being painted here in verse 18 is one of an animal pulling a cart with ropes. This is what I want you to see from this. Rather than seeing sin and wickedness and immorality and iniquity, rather than seeing that as a burden to be set free from, to be cut free from, they drag sin along with them, being in bondage to it, using falsehood, using deceit, as if cords of rope. Do you see that? They use cords of falsehood cords of deceit. In other words, they keep themselves in the dark so that they can remain attached to their sin. Now, although they may be intellectually able to understand what the Bible says, 
They will stay in their sin. They'll stay in their easy believism church because that's where they're comfortable. They won't separate from false doctrine because they want their sin. They'll stay in their spiritually dead church because they don't want to, at the end of the day, be separated from their sin. They don't want to follow the light of the world. They'd rather be in darkness. They'll stay in their sin-filled church Because ultimately they want their own sin. John says they love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Besides, they might say in verse 19, if we don't see God judge with our own eyes, then there's no reason to repent and turn from our sin. If we don't see his judgment for ourselves, there's no reason to turn from it. And so they mock God in verse 19. Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come. They're taunting God Almighty while in their sin. Deceived by the darkness, they taunt God, who will one day bring all of their evil deeds to light, right? Look at verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. The second point I want you to see from the second woe, is that the darkness is self-serving. The darkness is deceitful, and the darkness is self-serving. Apart from God's immovable and unchangeable law, darkened human reasoning, right? Darkened mind, minds and hearts darkened by sin, will twist and rationalize something into evil, something that they see as good. They're going to take that which is evil and twist it and rationalize it into something that they see as good. That's where you get two sodomites that might say to themselves, how would God or why would God forbid our love? God would be unjust to forbid the love of two people, right? They take something that is wicked, something that is evil, and they twist it into something that they see as good. Sweet and bitter Light and darkness, think about it now, good and evil. Sweet and bitter, light and darkness, good and evil, all relative to those who live in darkness. In other words, there is no absolute truth from God's word any longer. There is not a, thus saith the Lord. It's simply whatever works for me, that's what I see as good. That's what I see as sweet, right? Absolute truth, justice, righteousness then don't exist. It just becomes whatever benefits them. They redefine right and wrong to suit themselves. And we see that all over the place, don't we? But listen, there are many, many, many professing Christians who do that day in and day out. We have within our own breast an enemy. And it's our heart. The Bible says that the heart is what? Deceitful, desperately wicked, who can know it? deceitful and deceitful above all things. The darkness is deceitful and you have an ally of the darkness within your own chest. When you sin, it's so, we're so prone to justify our wicked lifestyle with the Bible. We'll twist it and cajole it and manipulate it until our lifestyle looks righteous in our own sight. Don't do that. Don't do that. You twist the scriptures to your own destruction when you do that. You'll find yourself one day in hell not having known or have a love for the truth of God in his word. Why do they do this? They do this because, the third point I want you to see, the darkness is born of human pride. The darkness is born of human pride. Look at verse 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. People believe that they are the masters of their fate. That they are the captains of their soul. So confident in their own opinions. So confident in their own reasoning. So confident in their own supposed understanding that they live like they don't need the light of God's wisdom. Let me submit to you also that the farther you get from faithfulness to God's word the more and more and more increasingly you are left to your own judgments, to your own faulty reasoning. That's why you need the Word of God. You need the Word of God day in and day out. You need to be meditating on it day in and day out. You've 
got to have the Word of God. To the degree that you neglect the Word of God is to the degree that you imperil your own soul. You must put the Word of God into your daily life. You must meditate. It has to be your delight. Look over to Isaiah chapter 8. Just a couple of pages to the right. Isaiah chapter 8. And drop down to verse 19 there. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 19. Here another example of the darkness. Look at verse 19. And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? People today will seek truth anywhere else they can get it besides God. They'll seek it from anywhere. They'll seek it from within themselves as if they are the masters of their fate, the captains of their soul, and the arbiters of all knowledge. Well, I think, or I believe, no, seek God. Should not a people seek their God? They reject the light of God's word for the darkness of human wisdom here. Fourth point is that the darkness represents ignorance and foolishness and superstition. Verse 20, God says, To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. God's word is the light that we need. Amen? God's word is the only source of divine truth. Anything that contradicts what God has said is a lie. And we you know, like, hear people on the news today, are oh, they misstated? Are they miscommunicated? No, it's a lie. They're liars. They spoke a lie. They didn't tell the truth. They're liars. And all liars have their place in the lake of fire. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. <laughs> Anyone that leads someone in a direction that is inconsistent with the clear teaching of the Bible has no light in them, verse 20 says. If it is false, if it is false, the light of God's truth is not in it. If it is false, the light of God's truth is not in it. Think about it. All of the lying, deceiving, or deceived charismatics. Words of prophecy. Words from the Lord. Listen. Listen. You are saying that your word of prophecy is a direct revelation from God Almighty who will hold all under the hearing of it to account. That's a thus saith the Lord. A word from the Lord. Tongues produced by the Holy Spirit. The fact that you contradict with those words of prophecy, those words from the Lord, those prophetic tongues, the fact that you contradict the Bible in word or in practice, reveals you, exposes you as a liar. All you modern day apostles and pastoras, verse 20 says you have no light in you. The Bible says that His Word, it's His Word that is a light lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So what becomes of those who preach and prophesy in darkness? What becomes of them? The fifth point is that darkness represents the judgment of God. What becomes of those who lie, who twist God's word to their own destruction, who preach a fabrication of their own imagination? Verse 21, they will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. It shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. I'm reminded of Revelation where those people who dwelt on the earth did not, they refused to repent of their sin and they cursed God who was pouring out His judgments upon them. They refused to repent. Verse 22 says, Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness and gloom of anguish and they will be driven into darkness. The end of those who walk in darkness has been appointed and it is darkness. Second Peter says, these are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Jude, verse 13 says that they are wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 13, bind him hand and foot 
Take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I think from the, from the prophet Isaiah now of what is represented by darkness. One, you have an intellectual component. It affects your mind, your ability to reason. It's falsehood, it's deceit, it's ignorance, it's foolishness. You have a darkened mind. There's a moral component. That which is dark is immoral and evil. It is self-serving. It is prideful. There's an experiential component. An experiential component. It is bondage, slavery, misery, death, fear. There's also a judicial component. Man is subject, because of the darkness, to death. And he is under the judgment of of God. Now, this is the darkness that has come into the world on account of sin. The darkness that is in your life apart from Christ, that is in your heart and your mind, your very soul. And this is the darkness into which the light of Jesus Christ shines. Just, I'm sure as you are, taken by that. How despicable, right? How disgusting, how wretched, how futile. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, the light, comes. Comes into this wicked, deplorable world. And takes on the form of a man, becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Just like in a dark room. If you were to light a candle and the darkness flees, completely cast out, the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the darkness of this world and dispels the darkness, chases away the darkness. He is the blazing light. Not as a star on a dark backdrop, but as light alone, casting out darkness. The Lord Jesus Christ is victorious over the darkness. And when there is a blazing light, there is no darkness. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Just another page there to the right. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ from Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Listen to this. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Now, this passage quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 4, verse 14. And this from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, fulfilled at the coming of the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Drop down to verse 6. Listen, this was written 700 years before Christ came. Written 700 years before Christ. Listen to this from verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, what? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. When Jesus was just a baby, when he was just a baby, Simeon, in Luke chapter 2, verse 32, called him the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. A light of the glory of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah speaks a lot of the darkness. But Isaiah also reveals the light. This is the grace and mercy of God. You notice the, the judgments are so fierce. They are so severe. Men should flee the judgment of God. And yet the light is so glorious. The light is so brilliant. Isaiah gives us both. Look at Isaiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 17. Verse 17 begins, Is it not yet a very little while while Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book. Amen. Right? You who were once deaf, do you hear? 
Can you hear the preaching of the word of God? The eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Amen. We were once in the dark, darkened by our sin, hopeless and destitute. And the Lord Jesus Christ shone in the darkness and our blind eyes were able to see. Verse 19, the humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Look at Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, a few more pages to the right. The mercy and grace of our God in sending the light of the world. Isaiah chapter 42, look down beginning in verse 1 with me. Behold, the Bible says, my servant whom I uphold. Who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what is called a servant song from the prophet Isaiah, one of four. A servant song. This is a a messianic prophecy. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, says God. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now, what will he do? Verse 2. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. In other words, the first time that he comes, he's not coming as the conquering king to execute judgment. He's coming as the suffering servant. He will not come with brute force or intimidation. He comes simply to seek and to save that which is lost. He comes to shine in a dark world. Verse 4, he will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. And what? A light to the Gentiles. That's right. To open blind eyes. To bring prisoners from the prison. To those who sit in darkness from the prison house. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to do that which the people of Israel failed to do. The people of Israel were called to be a light to the nations. A light to the Gentiles. And in their apostasy, in their sin, they failed to do that for which God called them to do. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes and accomplishes that. He becomes a light to the Gentiles. Verse 8, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another. Who is he glorifying here? The Lord Jesus Christ. And his glory he'll not give to another? It is because he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is the blessed trinity. He gives His glory to the Son. The Son gives His glory back to the Father, that the Father may be all in all. Here, He does not give His glory to another, nor praise to carved images. Verse 9, Behold, the former things have come to pass, new things I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49. Again, just a walk through the prophet, looking at this imagery of light from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 49 and drop down to verse 5. Here the Bible reads, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be His servant. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And to bring back Jacob to Him, so that Israel is gathered to Him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Verse 6. Indeed, He says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Praise God. Amen? That we're grafted into that promise that the Lord God had us in mind in this. Look at Isaiah chapter 60. He has come as a light to the Gentiles, a light to the world. That men and women from every tribe, every tongue, every nation might be saved. Isaiah chapter 60, look at verse 1. Here the Bible says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. 
For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. How many of you can say amen to that? You re recall your darkness and how it, there was just a deep darkness that covered you before God reached out and rescued you from the darkness. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, a deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Then looking forward into eternity, looking forward into the eternal state, drop down to verse 19. Verse 19. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. We will dwell in the light that is the glory of God and the glory of Christ for all of eternity. Dwelling in light. The created sun, the created moon will be snuffed out and that which will light eternity will be God Himself and all of His divine perfections. Christ and all of His glory and all of His exaltation. It will be the divine nature of God that lights the eternal state forever. Your sun, verse 20, shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. We'll look at that light, and we'll recall the glorious height to which God pulled us from such a depth. And we'll praise His name forever. 21, all your people shall be righteous. Praise God. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified, says God. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. This is um, referenced again later in your New Testament. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. John describes this scene. Regarding the new Jerusalem. Listen to this from Revelation chapter 21. And look with me at verse 23. Revelation 21, verse 23. This is glorious. It's glorious. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Amen. Verse 24, And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Better, in His light. We'll walk in His light. The kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be by no means enter it anything that defiles there won't be any darkness there. Nothing that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Praise the Lord. It's such a, a great imagery throughout the Scriptures with re regard to darkness and light. Darkness and light. We see that frequently back in John chapter 8. Back in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8 verse 12, the Lord Jesus Christ now draws upon all that Old Testament imagery, all that Old Testament prophecy, to make his opening statement under the lighted towers of the temple court. And to the people living in ignorance of God, he proclaims the wisdom of God. To those enslaved to evil and immorality, he preaches liberty to the captives. To those under the stain and guilt of darkness, he offers forgiveness and cleansing. To those in fear of death, condemned under the righteous judgment of God, he brings grace and mercy. And into our dark and dying condition, he cries aloud, I, I am the light of the world. And not merely a light there. Notice he is the light. He's the light. The lighted towers in the court of the women would have been put out at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. They would have been put out. Spiritually speaking, those lights, those towers in the court of the women 
were put out spiritually when they rejected their Messiah. If you remember, we've studied through John chapter 7, John chapter 8 now, and we've seen, beginning in John chapter 6, that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He's the bread of life, and that harkens back to that time in the wilderness wanderings where God provided for his people bread from heaven, manna from heaven, right? And then Jesus Christ in the water ceremony, the Feast of Tabernacles, we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of that which God provided for the nation of Israel in the wilderness, namely water out of the rock to provide for their thirst. And the Lord Jesus Christ became the bread of life, a fulfillment of the manna in the wilderness. He became the water from the rock to assuage our spiritual thirst. He fulfilled that Old Testament imagery in the wilderness wanderings. Here, as he sits under those towers, claiming to be the light of the world, we're reminded in the wilderness how the children of Israel followed the cloud by day and the fire by night, aren't we? He, he pictures that. That pictures him. That points forward to Christ as its fulfillment. That cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, was said to be a cloud of light. It was the light of God, that fire blazing by night. When the cloud moved, when the fire moved, the people took up their camp and they moved with Him. They moved with God. When the fire stopped, when the clouds stopped, the people stopped and they encamped. They followed God in the cloud, followed God in the fire by night. This is, in this festival, during the Feast of Tabernacles, a festival of lights where they lit those towers and the people danced with torches, pointed forward to the coming Messiah who would be the light of the world, who would be the light that Isaiah speaks of, who would take away the sins of the world, be a light to the Gentiles. And here, Jesus Christ fulfills that Old Testament imagery. He is the light of the world. And yet what happens? They reject Him out of hand. They reject the light of God to the world. And in that, they snuff out their own spiritual light. It makes the point. In their religious ceremony, which was instituted by God for their good, to be good, in all of their religious practice, in all of their religious ritual, If that ceremony, that practice, that worship doesn't point forward to Christ, it is meaningless, heartless, and dead. And God will snuff out the light. It's a point that we need to take to heart. Listen, all of our worship, all of your effort, all of your diligence, all of your obedience, all of your Bible reading, all of your prayer, if all of our striving doesn't ultimately find its end and purpose in the glory and exaltation of the Son, it is meaningless. It is heartless. It is dead ritual. Christ, the light of the world, all of that finds its end in the glory of Christ. Jesus here concludes His opening statement in John chapter 8, verse 12, by saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let's be clear about what it means to follow him. First, those who follow Christ turn back from following after their sin. This account comes on the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the woman caught in adultery where he tells her, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Those who follow Christ stop following the dictates of their own wicked heart. They stop following the dictates of their own wicked desires. And they turn to Christ in faith to trust and follow Him alone. That's what it means to begin following after Christ. That turning from sin is called repentance. It is a turning from sin. Not merely a changing of your mind. It certainly is a changing of your mind. But that changing of mind eventuates in a change of action... You turn from your sin. Turning to Christ to trust Him and to follow Him is faith. Turning from sin to put your faith in Christ is called conversion. We turn from sin to something. That's something. The object of our faith is Christ. The person of Christ. The work of Christ. Turning to the person of Christ is faith. We call that turning from sin, that repentance and faith, call that conversion. Paul describes it by saying in Colossians 1, Verse 13, 
that God, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Paul said in Acts chapter 26 that He was sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes. Now listen to this. That's regeneration. Paul in Acts 26 sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes, being born again, that's regeneration, in order to, I want you to note the order, in order to turn them from darkness to light. That's repentance and faith. Notice the order. Regeneration in order to turn them from their sin to the light. From darkness to light. From the power of Satan, he says there, to God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So is that where in verse 12, back in John chapter 8, verse 12, is that where the following him then ends? <laughs> no. No. What does it mean to follow? To follow him in verse 12 is to not walk in darkness. Or implied there, it means to walk in the light. To follow him is to turn from walking in darkness and to walk in the light. The word walk there describes a pattern of life. A pattern of life. It's the course or habit of your life. We hear the Christian life here referred to frequently as a walk. You might hear somebody say, my walk with Christ, right? My walk with Christ. It's just a pattern, a habit of your life. Christ defines it here in verse 12 as following him. Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He says, Walk as children of light. And with this statement of the Lord in verse 12, really get to the heart of what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is to follow the Lord, to walk after the Lord. And with this word, akoutheo in the, in the Greek, literal walking was involved. It was following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we really get to the heart of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is someone who has repented of their sin. They've put their faith and trust in Christ alone. And then they follow Christ as the habit or the pattern or the walk of their life from then on. They will not walk in darkness. Do you get that? They will not walk in darkness. The darkness of this world, the flesh or the devil. But they rather have the light They'd rather walk in the light that produces spiritual and everlasting life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 says this, listen. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Notice there the present tense <laughs> The present reality verbs in that statement. If we say we have fellowship with Him and present reality, walk in darkness, you're lying. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to God. If you say you have fellowship with God and yet you currently, present, as a present reality, walk as a pattern of your life in darkness, you lie. You don't practice the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, present tense, following after, in the light as He is in the light, We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Just with very great economy of words here, simple but profound statements, John just eradicates any notion that I can live a life that is devoid of Him or walking apart from Him or in open rebellion to Him and call myself a Christian. You walk in darkness, you're not entitled to any assurance of your salvation. You're walking in darkness. Now, all that is wrapped up in the meaning of the word follow. This word is akalotheo. Akalotheo. It's a military word. And it means, in a military sense, it describes a soldier who's lined up under his commanding officer and following his commanding officer into battle. Now think about the Christian life. What it means to follow Christ. You're following your commanding officer into battle. There's a war that rages in your members, right? It's used of a slave, a doulos, who obeys every call or command 
of his master. That phrase, that word, doulos, slave. Many of your Bibles interpret it or translate it as bond servant or servant. The word is slave, and it means slave. That is a common title, a common nomenclature for the Christian and what it means to follow Christ. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. That is slave language here. James Montgomery Boyce said, the path that Jesus Christ walked is the path to crucifixion. It leads to glory, but before that it leads to the cross. Such a path can be walked only by the one who has died to self and who has deliberately taken up the cross of Christ to follow him. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will what? Will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The salvation offered by Christ here is free. You simply receive it, so to speak, with the open hands of faith. It's a free offer. You believe upon him with genuine saving faith and you are free. You are forgiven. You're washed clean. But that's not a faith that is devoid of power to change your life. Following Christ then becomes extremely costly. In one sense, it will cost you your life. You're not the master of your fate. You're not the captain of your soul. You were bought at a price. And consider the price at which you were bought. The life of God's own Son. His shed blood for you. If you're in Christ by faith, He wrote your name down. Put your name in the book of life before the foundation of the world. I was thinking of you when his son was nailed to the tree. Two primary concerns here. Jesus tells the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. This idea of following Christ means to go and to sin no more. And two primary concerns with that. I want you to see that sin here comes in two basic forms. The first deals with sins of commission. Sins of commission. I want you to understand. And as John would say, little children, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. The willful, the willful, impenitent indulgence of sin in the mind or in your practice will send you to hell. Listen, the willful, impenitent indulgence of sin in your mind or in your practice will send you to hell. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What does it mean to follow Him? It means to walk in the light, not to walk any longer in the darkness. It is to turn your back on everything you were outside of Christ and to turn in faith to Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look, beginning with me at verse 9. Turn from your sin. Trust Christ. Verse 9 reads, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Sin is deceitful. Our hearts are deceitful. The arguments against this are deceitful. Listen, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, listen, any sexual immorality outside of marriage, any sex at all outside of marriage is sexual immorality and will send you to hell. It will send you to hell. Adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, None of those will inherit the kingdom of God. It cannot be stated any more clearly. That's not an exhaustive list. It's merely a representative list. The willful, impenitent indulgence of any sin in the mind or in your practice 
will send you to hell. And notice it's the willful, impenitent indulgence. I'm not talking about the person who is willing to be holy, who is striving and struggling, Romans 7, Romans 8, against that sin, who wants more than anything in the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. That one who is at war needs to be encouraged in Christ. I'm speaking of the one who willfully and unrepentantly, impenitently indulges himself, herself, with sin. It will send you to hell. God delivers, delivers the sinner from his sin. Look at verse 9, look at verse, um, verse 11, continuing on. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were set apart, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 29, He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. It's pretty radical, amen? You're to be plucking out and cutting off. Are you indulging sin? Are you willfully indulging sin? In impenitence, are you following after that which is an offense to God? Are you indulging? Listen, pluck it out and cut it off. There, he's not speaking of a literal plucking out of your eye. A blind man can commit adultery in his heart, can he? But take drastic measures. The Christian life is a radical life. The Christian life is a radical light of cutting off and plucking out. It's a radical turning from sin, the filth of this world that so easily ensnares us. Are you indulging that filth? Cut it off, pluck it out. It's better to cast that member away from you than to be cast into hell. Most of you, many people view the Christian life as a, a series of sins to avoid, right? I need to avoid this, I need to avoid that. But the Christian life is far more than that. The second point is dealing with sins of omission. There are sins of commission. Those things that you do that you shouldn't be doing. Those things that you indulge, that you need to turn from. And yet there are deal, uh, there's also, there are sins of omission. Listen, the willful impenitent failure on the part of the professing Christian to obey the commandments given to us in the Word of God will send you to hell. We'll send you to hell when you die. You hear that? The willful impenitent failure on the part of the professing Christians to obey the commandments of God will send you to hell when you die. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. This is part and parcel with what it means to live the Christian life. It is to turn from sin, to turn from the life you once lived for yourself and that ne- the life that you now live, you live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave Himself for us. Luke chapter 6. And look down with me at verse 43. Verse 43. Here the Lord says, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. Now examine yourself in the light of the Lord's words here. Think about your life in light of these words. Every tree, ma'am, every tree, sir, known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Who produces the good in us and the good in our hearts? Lord Jesus Christ does by His Spirit. God, by His Spirit, produces that good in us. And that good produces fruitfulness. Look at verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not 
do the things which I say. The Lord says that we are to meditate on His Word. And His Word is to be our delight. The Lord says that we are to pray. We are to pray without ceasing. The Lord says that we are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That we are to go, therefore, and make disciples. The Lord commands us to follow Him. Verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. It's not the one simply that wills to. It's the one who does. It's the one who hears and does. I will show you whom he is. Verse 48, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood rose, right? Judgment. When judgment came, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. Verse 49. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. When judgment comes, that one who is the Lord's who produces fruit, who has his life built on the bedrock of obedience, faithfulness to God's word, that one's going to stand on the day of judgment. Look over at Luke 14. Luke 14. You notice there's no in-between here. There's no middle ground. You cannot comfort yourself with the idea that at one time, at some moment in the past, that you once believed. Are you, present tense, following after Him? Look at Luke 14. And drop down to verse 23. Verse 23. Here, the Master, after this parable of the Great Supper... The master said to his servant, go out into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. You look at verse 25, great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he what? He cannot. He cannot be my disciple. What the Lord is saying here is that, you know, we have a tendency to think about love in sentimental, emotional terms. And there's certainly an emotional component that goes with biblical love. But this is the commitment to do that which Christ has called you to do above any other commitment by far that you may have in your life. It is a commitment of such priority a, co- a commitment of such supremacy that all other commitments fade as almost seemingly meaningless. If it comes to a decision between God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and my wife, I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm stuck between an impossible situation of following the Lord Jesus Christ and my family, I have a supreme commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen, most professing evangelical Christians today, when it comes to following the Lord Jesus Christ, or whether I'm going to work another 30 minutes so I can get another half hour of pay on my check, they're not willing to sacrifice that. And how would they sacrifice? Say they would sacrifice their life for Him? No, I don't think so. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, you cannot be my disciple. Everything else fades. Listen, we are on a short time schedule here. We are not citizens of this dark world. We are citizens of the kingdom. Act and live as citizens who have their homeland in another location. Forsake all other priorities. Forsake the supremacy, the priority that you place on all those things, and follow Christ supremely. That's what the Lord is saying here. He says in verse 27, Whoever does not bear the instrument of his own execution... Right, despising the life that you once lived, despising the, the flesh that still embattles itself already in you against the Spirit, despising that life and pressing on after Christ. He says, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, now listen, intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost. It is costly to live the Christian life. When you give your life to Christ, listen, It is no nominal, cavalier, easy following. It is an all or nothing 
proposition. What will you do when it comes to determining your priorities? Where do you start? You start with God. You start with Christ. You start with His Word. You don't start with job or paycheck or family or pleasure or leisure. In all things, Christ is supreme. He is preeminent. You build this tower. For which of you intending to build a tower? It's the tower of your life. It's the tower of your life. You're building a life. Which of you intending to build your life in the Christian faith? Building your life upon Christ and His Word. Following Him. Does not sit down first and count the cost. Whether He has enough to finish it. Listen, this is going to be hard. You're going to face persecution. You're going to come across difficult decisions. There are going to be times when you don't feel like it, but you're commanded to anyway. There are going to be times when you have to question your priorities and get your proverbial spiritual ducks in a row and do what God has called you to do rather than what you and your flesh want to do. This life is not an easy life. You may lose friends. You may lose a husband, lose a wife, lose family. You may lose your life. You certainly lose your independence to make decisions for yourself. You were bought at a price. You're not your own. Obey the Lord. He says in verse 29, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, and all who see it begin to mock him. You know, that one who comes, he says, sets out. I want to follow the Lord. I want to follow the Lord. He lays the foundation. He says, I've turned from my sin to follow Christ. Foundation has been laid, but now he goes on and he doesn't finish. He doesn't follow after him. He stops. Stops reading his Bible. Stops praying. Starts looking no different than the world. And the rest, the world, sits around and mocks that one. Look at this guy. He calls himself a Christian. He's not a Christian. Look how he lives his life. Look at the day. He looks no different than me. He saw the same movie I saw last night. He did the same thing at the club that I did last night. He drinks the same brand of liquor that I drink, right? Right? They look no different than the world. And those in the world stand by and mock that one because he wasn't able to finish. Saying, verse 30, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, verse 31, going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Are you able to wage war? That's what the Christian life is. Are you able to go into battle, not merely set out? You get yourself all dressed up, right? You put on your armor. You grab the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You take off into battle, and then you sit there in the trench and don't fight. There's no battle going on for holiness, no battle against your sin, no battle for righteousness, no stand for the truth. You're not following the Lord. You're just sitting back in your tent while the rest of the army is out in the field. Or else, verse 32, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation, asks for conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. It just can't be any clearer. Are you, are you failing in any point of obedience? Are you failing? Right now, as you examine yourself before the Lord, is there an area of your life where you're not obeying the Lord? You're not being faithful? Men, men, listen to me, men. Are you faithfully providing for your household both financially with your work, spiritually with the Word of God. Are you discipling your family, discipling your kids? Are you providing for them? Ladies, are you submitting to your husband? Are you submissive to your husband? Listen, the willful, the willful, impenitent failure to do any of that which the Lord commands will send you to hell. The willful and impenitent failure on the part of the professing Christian to obey the Lord. Someone says, I know him, but you don't keep his commandments. The Bible says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Children, kids, listen to me, kids. Are you obeying your parents from the heart? Are you obeying them from the heart? Does your life reflect a devotion to the Lord? All of this, in many ways, also in the Word of God, is encompassed in this statement that following Christ is to make disciples. You're, you're here, this side of heaven, 
saved to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in making disciples for the glory of God. Being a witness for Christ. He leads us out of darkness into light. And then John turns and says, the Lord Jesus Christ says, John writes the account um, where he says, I'm sorry, it's Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world, Jesus Christ says. And then upon you coming to him in faith and turning to follow him, he then says to you, you are the light of the world. Now go and make disciples. We have a responsibility, don't we? It's a responsibility to our brothers to minister to them, to edify them. We have a responsibility to the lost. It's the tip of the spear to take the gospel out to a lost and dying world. And the Lord says that when you receive power, the Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses to Him. Are you making disciples? Now think about it. Examine yourself in light of God's Word. I didn't sneak in your room overnight and write those things in your Bible. These things are written, the Lord. These are the Lord's words. This is the Lord's testimony. These are, this is His teaching. His instruction for what a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ looks like. The difficulty is, often, is that a vast majority of Christianity doesn't teach this. It doesn't instruct us from the Word of God this way. And so a vast majority of what people call Christianity is not Christianity. And so when you start following Christ in earnest, you look countercultural. Countercultural. Certainly countercultural to the world, but even countercultural within quote unquote Christian circles. You know what happens when that happens? You start getting persecuted. You take a stand for the truth, you take a stand for the truth, and you're gonna you're gonna incur fire. They call it quote unquote friendly fire. It's not so friendly. <laughs> we've we've suffered through that, haven't we? It ain't friendly. That's that's what following Christ is. Remember. Jesus said also, if you are ashamed of me and what? My words, I'll be ashamed of you when I stand before the Father. This is an all or nothing proposition. This is what it means to follow Christ. Are you following him? Where are you at today? Are you just sort of camped out in the tent while the rest of the body is out fighting? The world just sits by and mocks the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, just sits by and mocks. Look at this one. Started out, ha, can't finish. Do we do that in our own power? Do we do that in our own strength? No. If you're a genuine child of light, then God has poured out light into the darkness of your heart. His spirit indwells you. And he sees to it that you walk in the light. Now we can resist that. We can grieve the Holy Spirit for a time, for a time. But the willful, impenitent sin will send you to hell. You have to turn from that sin. You have to turn back to the Lord. And you have to serve Him faithfully and fervently afresh again. It's an all or nothing proposition. So many today living according to the world's priorities... So many today calling themselves Christians and living according to the dictates of their own hearts, their own desires, they indulge their flesh. And they call themselves by Christ's name who died and gave himself. They want the same things this world wants and they busy themselves with what the world prioritize, prioritizes. Why would anyone consider such a costly endeavor? Why would anyone want to do that? Right? The Bible talks about it as waging war. <laughs> Why would anyone want to go into that kind of a Christian life? Are you waging war? If not, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And you'll suffer judgment one day. Listen, get on board. Turn from your sin. Put your faith in Christ. Get into the battle. Get into the fray. Follow him. Why would anyone want to wage war like that? Why would anyone want to enter that kind of a life that is so diametrically opposed to everything around us? Why? Because we have the light. He says, so that we won't walk in darkness. We can escape the darkness, verse 12, and have the light of life. We escape sin and judgment, perdition, hellfire, condemnation. All that is taken away 
And we have the light of life. The power in us to live for Him and to please Him. And we have Christ. For all eternity, we'll have Christ. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We do it by faith. By trusting Him and the power of His Spirit. You can't ever begin to think. Never. You can never think that it's our following that saves us. <laughs> There's the thought. The Lord saves us and it empowers us to live for Him. Uh, one of the evidences that the Lord has saved you, that there's been a, great, a work of grace in your heart, and that there's genuine saving faith taking up residence there, is that you follow. Are you following? Present tense. And remember, He says, I am before he says, they follow, right? Praise God. It's a glorious salvation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word. God, I pray that we would take these truths to heart. God, help us to see clearly through the sludge and depravity of our own hearts to see truly the glory of the salvation you provided us in Christ. God, to see clearly how we are so prone to justify our sin, to justify our apathetic, indifferent, so-called nominal Christian lives. And God, convict us of that. Find us faithful to abandon it with reckless abandon, cutting off and gouging out to live for you, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, because we love you, because you have given everything to redeem us to yourself, because you shed your own blood, because you are our Lord and Savior, because you are the light of the world, and because we can escape the darkness, because we can be out from under judgment and wrath and condemnation. Praise you and thank you, Lord, for this glorious, glorious promise in the Scriptures. Thank you, Lord, that you are the light in this dark world. Help us to be faithful to you, Lord, in going out with that light. Thank you that you employed us in the work of being lights. May we be faithful to you in that work. Praise be to God. We worship you and thank you, Lord, and will for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.